So now it's Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. It's a packed week for news for this one. Crisis is coming back. There's a Crisis Remastered coming out. Crytek showed that off in the past couple of days. Minecraft RTX has launched in a beta state. There's DLSS 2.0 from NVIDIA as well that's supposed to fix a lot of the issues with DLSS 1.0 and its blurry unveil. Uh, Sony PlayStation 5 rumors about, well, the availability or manufacturing and the pricing issues it may face. Hard drive makers seemingly hiding shingled magnetic recording technology and uh, a lot work. of other stuff. Folding at home, making some big news, and then Ryzen 3 rumors as well. So, well, three, Very like the four choppy. cores. We'll talk about that. Before that, this video is brought to you by Gigabyte Aorus RTX 2080 Ti Extreme. The RTX 2080 Ti Extreme is built with a triple axial cooling solution and Doesn't ready for anyone no, interested no, no, no. in it. It was a Kingpin signed PCB. Uh, one of three, we had three of them here, we've sold two now, and the item sold to benefit Cat Angel, the shelter where uh, we helped them take in a new kitten, and also they uh, could use some additional funding since a lot of the corporate backers right now are in questionable economic straits, so they pulled back funding for charities. Anyway, the item sold to someone named Cole, and uh, it was sold for $2,450. The donation should be drafted. I think eBay's policy is within 21 days of sale, they'll take the money and send it to the charity that was chosen. And it's going to be 100% of that sale will go towards Cat Angels. We're going to box up the items and ship them out in the next day or so. So really good news on that. Uh, separately, just, I guess we'll mention this. Deep Cool has kind of been making the rounds lately. You've probably seen some of the people you follow on Twitter, like maybe Paul from Paul's Hardware or Brian from BPS Customs have received a a box of surgical masks and a couple of the uh, PPE suits from Deepcool, which is working with a factory to send these things out to some of the companies that it works with, including media. And we, we picked one up too. Uh, Paul, I believe, donated it to a hospital when he got it, and we thought, you know, that's, that's a pretty good idea. We'll help out our local group as well. And so we worked with uh, someone I know who works at one of the major hospitals near us, and we donated those over there. So thanks to Deep Cool for sending that out. Uh, they will definitely make use of it. We were told that the 200 or so masks should be about a week's supply uh, for the team that we donated it to. So that's that's pretty big dent in things. Okay, moving on to the hardware news. Let's start with Crisis and Crytek. Crytek, which has uh, presumably at this point resumed paying its employees, we're not sure, but they woke the Crisis Twitter account which hadn't been used since about 2016 to tweet some nebulous, vague uh, teaser messages to try and get everyone hyped about why that might be happening. Crisis Remastered is the reason that it's happening. Yeah, There's no but release date yet, aside from the It's not really a soon, good game. And most of the information about it is extremely basic. In a move that was Plus only, it's a time graphic pill up to head the head. media and the user base as presumably an accidental so, leak. I don't know. The Crisis webpage for Crisis Remastered was published and then taken down in a flash. And the, the skeptical among us, among us who's been doing this for long enough probably saw that and thought, wow, that sure seems like an architected marketing trick for a game that has to do at least partially with uh, things like stealth mode. So anyway, architected marketing trick or not, Crisis Remastered is a thing. It's supposed to have API agnostic ray tracing. This is something that Crytek showed off previously with its engine. 
where it got big news coverage because it was the first AMD can do ray tracing too type of thing, which that's, I mean, all the cards can do ray tracing, it's just whether it can do it in real time or not. Anyway, they did it with an API agnostic solution that did run on older Nvidia cards and on AMD cards. That got covered previously. That's supposed to be coming over to Crisis Remastered. We are currently uncertain at this time to what extent Crisis Remastered might or might not leverage the NVIDIA RT hardware that's native to the RTX 20 series. So we'll obviously follow that up as we learn more. No release date. We know that it's coming out on PC, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and actually this is pretty big news, the Nintendo Switch. Oh. The first time that a Crisis game has been the Nintendo platform or ecosystem at all, and they were making a big deal out of that. But that's about all we know right now. It'll be fun though. We're looking forward to working with it. It'll be a good benchmarking piece and obviously a fun throwback as well. Next one, NVIDIA pushing its Minecraft RTX update alongside Mojang. And uh, it's currently in beta. It came out on the Windows Store this week and it follows up on one of NVIDIA's biggest name gets since the RTX product line launched. NVIDIA obviously had a very slow rollout. It was from memory something about 55 days or so before the first RTX ready title actually came out, which was Partially a Microsoft issue since they didn't push DXR in time, but also, I mean, they did market their entire product line on that feature and it took a while. So it's been rolling out for a while now, but Minecraft's the biggest name get they've gotten. The Minecraft ray tracing plugins or mods have existed for a while now. You may have seen some. Uh, we've seen some confusion online about, wait, didn't, was this already a thing? But no, this is explicitly different. This will leverage the RT hardware on NVIDIA RTX products, whereas the previous mods did not, at least to our knowledge, do that, and they were less optimized. So, in a big way, at least if you have RT hardware. So Minecraft a big, with the big RTX big update will introduce a new PBR, or physically based oh, rendering oh. system, which this, we actually have an interview with Crytek from probably four to six years ago about what physically based rendering is, and we have one with Chris Roberts from the Star Citizen team as well. Search the channel for PBR and you'll find it, but anyway. They're adding standard support to mats for things like materials, that is, for things like roughness. Mats will support reflections, refractions, global illumination based on their properties and the properties of the light around them. This is all pretty standard stuff, but you know, look at Minecraft and it wasn't before, obviously. DXR and RTX will add volumetric effects like crepuscular rays. These are often referred to as god rays and fog. The expected reflections on surfaces, which would reflect, will also be added. And there's new emissive lighting for lava and glowstones and things that would emit light. This update also brings DLSS 2.0 to Minecraft, which Nvidia admits as being the fix to its DLSS 1.0 blunder. DLSS 2.0 uses tensor cores on RTX GPUs to, quote, offer image quality comparable to native resolution while rendering only one quarter to one half of the pixels. <coughs> one of the biggest problems with DLSS 1 was its per game deployment and the fact that it was uh, like, smearing Vaseline on your monitor. This is something that NVIDIA is trying to fix with DLSS 2.0, and the company has taken big steps to do so. It wrote the following on its blog post, the original DLSS required training the AI network for each new game. DLSS 2.0 trains using non-game specific content, delivering a generalized network that works across games. This means faster game integrations and ultimately more DLSS games. The new DLSS will also have quality settings, including a performance mode, and that's supposed to help negate the performance hit from ray tracing. These two were meant to go together since day one, but they rolled out uh, asynchronously and then both had issues of their own. But when the idea for of DLSS is that it's supposed to, in theory, cards. help reduce the so. workload on the GPU with drawing the pixels and free up some of that computational time, some of the cycles, for doing the RT graphics. So um, they're meant to be used together. NVIDIA is doing this by I'm using a neural network and a DGX supercomputer. Why? The way it's doing that's a bit different, but the network takes images generated by the game engine as input, including a focus on motion vector analysis to plot a history of object movement and project its future movements. And NVIDIA writes the following on its blog. <laughs> nice. Quote, During the training process, the output image is compared to an offline rendered ultra high quality 16K reference image. And just as a side note, this is typically referred to as the ground truth image. The quote continues, the difference is communicated back into the network so that it can continue to learn and improve its results. This process is repeated tens of thousands of times on the supercomputer until the network reliably outputs a high quality, high resolution image. So NVIDIA then has completely reworked DLSS 
and uh, it's worth worth looking at once again. Next one, hard drive makers seemingly hiding SMR technology. It seems that deploying SMR in hard drives without telling anyone is the new the new fad these days. It's all the rage. Every hard drive maker is doing it. Uh, for the uninitiated, SMR or shingled magnetic recording is a process that adds density without actually adding any platter. SMR writes new data tracks that overlap the existing data tracks and it essentially shingles the data tracks akin to shingling a roof, uh, hence the shingled naming. So this allows hard drive makers to economically increase density without adding platters or altering the read-write heads, which is important in the ever-waning HDD market that's been mostly relegated to cheap storage. However, it comes with a serious caveat in terms of random write performance. If any data track has to be modified or new data has to be written, any shingled data tracks have to be completely rewritten alongside it. This makes SMR inferior for write-intensive applications. This in itself isn't necessarily a problem, but hard drive makers not disclosing it to the customers is. For instance, it became apparent via Reddit and a Tom's Hardware report that Western Digital is currently shipping WD Red drives, which are used in NASA's, we actually use a lot of those, for uh, using SMR, and that's without identifying the drives as using SMR. Whoa, 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 so whoa, users easy. on Reddit have claimed that these drives are performing poorly, they can't be reconfigured correctly in ZFS arrays, and are problematic in RAID setups, among other issues. On the heels of this news, it swiftly became apparent that Toshiba and Seagate engage in the same nebulous practice, thanks to Chris Mellor with Block and Files. Toshiba confirmed to Block and Files that <laughs> 300 uses SMR hey. does not document the use of SMR in any customer documentation. I explode by myself for my own grenade. That many of its hard drives in no. the Barracuda line use SMR, but again, that's not made clear to customers in any documentation. SMR is fine for worm, or write once, read many, or cold data storage, or anything that's read intensive. It's really the write that matters here. However, with all three hard drive makers decisively marketing certain hard drives without disclosing the use of SMR, uh, it's inevitable that more customers, unbeknownst to them, will end up with a product that performs in a way which they didn't expect. So that's really the problem here. Hopefully the tactic will change, but uh, don't color us as hopeful. AMD recently trotted out its latest Epic offerings to bolster its assault on Intel's server market share. The new Epic 7F Blank 2 line is still Epic Rome derivatives based on Zen 2. However, they are essentially frequency optimized counterparts to some of AMD's existing SKUs in the Epic 7 II stack. AMD is also claiming the Epic 7F2 CPUs represent the quote, world's highest per core performance x86 server CPU. The Epic 7 F2 line consists of a, a 32, a 52, and a 72 for the product name. So 7 F, 72, 32, 52, they are uh, from lowest to highest, 8 core, 16 thread, 16 core, 32 thread, and then there's a 24 core, 48 thread option as well. First and foremost, all the SKUs have a 500 megahertz increase to the base clocks, and there's a significant uplift in nice the boost clocks as well. There's also a significant increase in the L3 cache. So specifically, the L3 cache increases include moves to 128 megabytes for the 7F32, and then there's also moves to 256 megabytes, 192 megabytes for the other CPUs as well, which not that it really works this way, but with that much cache, you could actually fit some old PC games in the entirety of cache on the CPU. Uh, nothing is for free, however. These new chips come with higher TDPs, for whatever you make of that number. We have a video on that if you're curious. Uh, to the tune of 180 watts, 240 watts, at least against themselves, it's comparative. Additionally, the new 7F2 chips will come with similar gains in price, as these are essentially binned, cherry-picked chips. The Epic 7F, 32, 52, and 72 will have a 1K unit pricing ranging from $2,100 to $3,100, uh, 2450 in the middle there. And these positioning the chips for <laughs> use in databases, commercial high-performance computing, or HPC, and hyper-converged infrastructure workloads. AMD has also already seen customers within its ecosystem adopting the Epic 7F2 line, including names such as Dell, HPE, IBM Cloud, and Microsoft. Next up, per a report on Bloomberg, Sony might be dialing back its production of the upcoming PS5 console because of cost concerns and uh, concerns about the wider market adoption on initial launch in the first year. A quick note, we have to point out that Bloomberg has a checkered history 
of accuracy with rumors in the technology space. So we wouldn't trust their rumors quite as much as Digital Times, but this one's got some merit to it. According to Bloomberg, citing sources uh, allegedly close to Sony, it seems that Sony is concerned that there will be some sticker shock for the PlayStation uh, 5. Oh, and shit. both Sony and Microsoft here have been it's making okay. massive generational leaps in terms of hardware. They're both moving to eight core, 16 thread parts from AMD with semi-custom SOCs, 16 gigabytes of GDDR6, and we're still not quite at price parity with GDDR5, but it's getting closer, and fairly dense solid state storage systems. Uh, none of this is cheap, by the way. Of course, Sony and Microsoft have touted these specs, Microsoft more so than Sony, without addressing the giant elephant in the room of price. While nothing concrete has surfaced, if we're going to use passive voice, it's been suggested that $499 could be the new normal for consoles, uh, as more potent hardware will facilitate a much higher price. And also, higher power consumption is another aspect thrown there, too. Furthermore, Bloomberg mentions that game developers working on games for the PlayStation 5 are expecting a price point for the console of between $500 and $550, if those rumors are accurate. It seems Sony is wary of overproducing consoles for its first run, and given the current economic climate, there are also other factors to consider, too. More people might be stuck at home, yes, but a massive amount of people are also losing their jobs or on reduced hours. So there's absolutely no certainty right now as to what the buying market for entertainment devices is going to look like at the end of the year. And that's probably going to affect the manufacturing run, uh, potentially more so than just the price of the unit itself. More than 500,000 Zoom accounts have surfaced on the dark web, which is probably television's favorite thing to talk about, the dark web. It's this mystical place. In today's episode of Delete Zoom, we're going to talk about the recent history of how some 500,000 Zoom accounts have been exploited. And your company uh, may be one of the ones that started using this recently, so it's, it's probably worth passing the story along to IT. Zoom has risen to prominence in the last couple of weeks, largely thanks to the pandemic. And it's also because Microsoft uh, hasn't yet decided what it wants to do with its own platform, Skype, which has been left to rot in the corner somewhere. According to Zoom CEO, <laughs> Eric in this Ben, corner the somewhere. Zoom exploded from 10 million in December <laughs> nice. to 200 million this past March, <laughs> highlighting that pre-pandemic, no one really knew what Zoom was. With a surge in its user base came a magnifying glass that put Zoom security, or the lack thereof, under closer examination. Everything from the lack of end-to-end -end encryption, which Zoom promised and didn't deliver, to seriously questionable call routing, all the way to the more prominent and repugnant Zoom bombing has arisen in recent weeks. Not to mention security experts have found multiple flaws that affect both Windows and Mac users. To Zoom's credit, the company has scrambled to release patches addressing some of these issues and has vowed to ratchet up security development over the next several months. Not to Zoom's credit, Zoom bombing, which is still plaguing the service. To salt the wound, earlier this week, over 500,000 Zoom accounts surfaced and some selling for less than a penny. Others were being given away for free, which is a common practice on dark web hacking forums. First one's for free, it works apparently in this context as well. So most of the credentials that have surfaced on the dark web were obtained via credential stuffing attacks. And this is an instance where attackers use credentials exposed in past data breaches. So you have a, a set of passwords that are known against a set of common usernames or emails that are known and then can, can attempt to use those same credentials to access a different service. Which, by the way, this is a great time to remind you that uh, one of the easiest things you can do, albeit annoying, for your own security is to use different passwords for every service. The point of this isn't because you're, you're not... I think, I think there's some trouble with explaining this sometimes, but the biggest thing with using different passwords is because you're, you're not likely to be a targeted attack. So it's unlikely that there's some hacker with a hoodie up uh, on the dark web looking specifically for you. More likely they're pulling a set of passwords that's already out there from some previous leak on some random website, forum, uh, whatever. Zoom apparently is one of them. And then they're going to run that against the email that you use or the username that you use on websites where it might matter, maybe banks or whatever. 
financial sites, things like that, or just yeah, mm -hmm. trying to get access to, to other information, which is financial kind of stuff. So using a different password, or uh, one that's not discussed a lot, a different email or username for different sites is a great way to secure yourself. Anyway, moving on. Per bleeping computer, Zoom has, quote, hired multiple intelligence firms to find these password dumps and the tools used to create them, as well as a firm that has shut down thousands of websites attempting to trick users <coughs> into downloading malware or giving up their credentials. We continue to investigate our locking accounts we have found to be compromised, asking users to change their passwords to something more secure, and are looking at implementing additional technology solutions to bolster our efforts. Seriously though, get, get some kind of password manager. Uh, uh, we're not security experts, but uh, that seems like a pretty easy one to, to help out. Folding at home hits 2.4 exaflops. We're, we're gonna go ahead and use the flops naming again. Uh, the meteoric rise of Folding at Home's compute power continues unabated, and it follows successful recruiting campaigns from the likes of NVIDIA, PCMR, and tech publications, including ours, Linus's, and several others that you know of. I think Paul did a video as well. So, uh, Folding at Home has notched several milestones recently, such as uh, a couple weeks ago. Six was the battery. power that would best the top seven supercomputers combined, and at least x86 flops, and now, Folding at home is touting a combined 2.4 exaflops of computational power spread across its distributed network. For those counting, that's more than the <coughs> top 500 supercomputers combined, at least in terms of sheer x86 exaflops, that's what it is. Of course, supercomputers might do certain things better, like their usual military and nuclear research for which they're often deployed, and these two aren't necessarily directly comparable, but it's a fun comparison to make. The heightened interest in Folding at Home's projects has led to something of a drought in terms of work units, something that Folding at Home has been aware of and working direct upon. Quote, more GPU work units are coming from at Folding at Home. We've had to shift some of our efforts from setting up projects to moving data off servers to make more room for more data. It's amazing how quick the data is coming in, something like six terabytes per hour, said Greg Bowman, Folding at Home's uh, director via Twitter. So if you're curious, GN's machines, uh, we've got two editing machines that we have running, folding at home in the off hours when the editor oh, is And those go. are capable of producing about 7 million points per day when they're full of work units, but that, that doesn't happen right now. So right now we're seeing more between 4 million and 6 million points per day. If you want to join the team, it's 234-771. You can go into the configuration setting of folding at home and type that in. You'll join our team. No, 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 no. Let, let you go one side and you are As Snowflake the Cat, one of our users. Thank you. That was an awesome one. I think there was a Steve's hair in there as well. Anyway, uh, we've moved up into the top 100 teams of all time. We started at uh, low, low, like way down in the depths. I don't know if it was in the thousands or the deep hundreds. But we were way down there just a month ago, and we're in the top 100 now. Linus is currently ranked number four, and uh, we're at number 81, moving up significantly in the last month. So thanks for joining. It's been a lot of fun. And as soon as there's more work units available, I really want to do more with this idea because I think it'd be fun to build basically like in a mining system frame, except for folding work, but there's not enough work units right now. Next one, or last one, I think. Uh, rumor for Ryzen 3 3100 and 3100X. Everyone's favorite hardware leaker is back this week with purported information regarding rumored Ryzen 3 chips. Last year's Ryzen 3000 family notably never produced Ryzen 3 chips for desktop. And just to be exceptionally clear here, Ryzen 3 is not to be confused with Zen 3, nor is it to be confused with a Ryzen 3000 as the whole, which is already out. Ryzen 3 in this instance is referring to the R3 chips, which have been neglected for the most part other than the APUs since the first generation of Ryzen and Zen. So uh, the R3 1300X and 1200 were the originals, and it looks like that series is coming back. There's been APUs again in between. Anyway, via Twitter, uh, Momomo US has pointed us towards information showing a four core, eight thread Ryzen 3 3100, and alleged Ryzen 3 3100X as well. And given the naming, we can assume that these will be based on Zen 2, Although, you know, it's like 1600 AF kind of throws that out the window too, but can assume they're Zen 2, can assume they're seven nanometer silicon. Furthermore, the 3100 would run at an alleged clock speed of 3.9 gigahertz, while the 3100X would feature a clock speed of 4.3. We're assuming boost here, not base or all core. The leak didn't note whether these uh, were base or boost, but you know, should be pretty obvious. 
The leak further mentions a 65 watt TDP for whatever that's worth, a cache of 18 megabytes, and they would no doubt line up for targeting the lower end i3 SKUs from Intel, uh, which are difficult to justify anyway against something like an R5 1600 AF. So uh, we'll look into these if they uh, exit rumor status, but either way, Andy at this point is largely competing with itself. The R5 1600 AF and the 2600, which is basically the same thing, are going to be really tough to beat, especially at the $85, the, the intentional $85 price, and it's not always there, of the AF. Uh, so that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.cameratexas.net to help us out directly. Thanks, Nexus. Uh... Hi. Yes, it's 5G whack job time. <laughs> Let's have a good laugh at all the hysteria, mass hysteria, dogs and cats living together. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. About how 5G is causing the coronavirus and all sorts of rubbish like this. Anyway, of course, Thunderfoot has already covered this. Uh, so I'll link in his video about the 5G causing coronavirus. But I th I've had a whole bunch of people contact me about whack job 5G stuff, because if you have a look uh, recently in the news, like this is like the last day or whatever, last couple of days, YouTube tries to limit spread of false 5G coronavirus claims after mobile phone towers attacked. Uh, cell phone towers attacked as conspiracy theories in co connecting 5G and coronavirus gain steam. At least 20 UK phone masks vandalized over false 5G coronavirus claims. 5G cell towers torched in the UK. <laughs> People are saying coronavirus is a cover up for 5G. <laughs> it's like whack job central, really. This is hilarious. Celebrities are spreading a wacky coronavirus 5G conspiracy theory and they need to stop. Minister claims 5G coronavirus conspiracy theories is dangerous nonsense. <laughs> conspiracy between New Zealand lockdown and 5G <coughs> rollout unraveled and blah 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 blah. Anyway, it's it's just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, all of these 5G antennas on these cruise ships, they're really causing the coronavirus. Virus. Oh, it's just burying the needle on the mental retardation PKE meter. This is insane. <laughs> anyway, there's like mental videos like this. Some people have pointed me to about some whack job who's done a teardown of a 5G street light and it's a weapon and he shows various modules. I won't look, I'm not even kind of <laughs> This is ridiculous. I'm not even going to. Uh, this will not be a proper debate. We're just going to have a laugh and we'll actually go through this international appeal to stop 5G on Earth and space. Anyway, um, well, when was this? Uh, anyway, Ampower 430. I recommend you listen to it. This is Sharia from the Signal Path who is uh, heads up the millimetre wave uh, ASIC research team at Bell Labs, actually designing the millimetre wave ASICs used in 5 5G technology and he talks all about this. So if you want to know the technical uh, details about all this, uh, by all means, check that out. Um, it highly recommend it. I'll link it in down below. It's Shara and I like talking for like an hour, an hour and a half about um, the millimeter wave design and transmission and all sorts of stuff. So really cool. Anyway, let's go over to here. This, people have been pointing to me to this, the 5G space appeal.org, an emergency appeal to the world's governments by scientists, doctors, environmental organizations, and others. So yeah, if you read the appeal here, and we will go through it, it's, look at all this, and it's all referenced. Look at all these little numbers next to every single thing is referenced, and we could spend hours and hours and hours going down. Oh my God, look at this. Unbelievable. And here's all the references. Here we go. We could look at all, we could go in and cite all of these references. But I thought, I haven't gone through it yet, but <laughs> this is whack job central stuff, really. Let's just, ah, uh, let's go. But first of all, follow the Whoa. money. Let's oh, go shit. to the about What I'm doing? Here. Who's actually running this? The signatories to this appeal are scientists, doctors, environmental organizations from every continent who have been working tirelessly for many years to call the world's attention to an invisible assault on our biosphere. But that assault can be ignored no longer. 5G, the fifth generation of wireless technology, must not be built on Earth or in space. The notion that radio frequency, commonly known as radio waves, is somehow not real radiation and is harmless was disproven in the 1970s. 
revenues and laboratories all over the world, and the harm to humans, animals, and plants has since been confirmed in over 10,000 peer-reviewed studies. If 5G is built, radiation levels will increase 10 to 100-fold, virtually overnight, everywhere. There will literally be no place on Earth to hide from it. The effects and of levels of radio frequency radiation already existing now on the health of the population and the environment as reflected in quality of life, high rates of cancer, neurological disease, heart rate, diabetes, even in children plummeting populations of birds, bees and butterflies and unhealthy forests can be seen and felt everywhere. Yeah, it's probably like those sort of things have probably got you know, nothing to do with the fact that the, like, the earth has like warmed up like what is it half a degrees or at least or something in the last like 30 50 years or something like that so um yeah no it's you know correlation always equals causation oh we've had yeah b, b numbers are plummeting so it's gotta be the 5g radiation winning really nice. Because if we go over to spurious correlations here, I mean, look at this, suicides by hanging, strangulation and suffocation matches the US spending on science, technology, uh, space and technology. Clear, uh, you know, uh, correlation equals causation here. The number of people who have drowned by falling into a pool and versus films Nicolas Cage has appeared in. That's it. <laughs> correlation there pretty good. Look at this per capita cheese consumption. The number of people who have died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. And we, we just have to stop cheese consumption. I, I'm going to start a like a, a, an appeal thing now. Get, get signatories. This is ridiculous. Look at how many people they got to sign this. As of April 7, 227,596 people. That's how people stupid uh, people are. From 211 nations and territories have signed this appeal. Wow, let's uh, let's have a look at Australia. Our land, our water, our future in Gosford. Abundant happiness. <laughs> Australian College of Environmental Studies. Of course, an organic store. So yeah, all of these companies, <laughs> all these organisations have all signed this. <laughs> That's just in Australia. I mean, this is just ridiculous. <laughs> so let's check out the person behind this, Arthur Fristenberg. He's uh, for his CV, go to cellphonetaskforce.org. Ah, oh, this is good. Ah, oh, curriculum vitae. Ah, our good mate Arthur. Let's have a look. He's the founder and president of Cell Phone Task Force and author of The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life. Bestseller. He is also author of Microwaving Our Planet, The Environmental Impact of the Wireless Revolution. Cell Phone Task Force, 1996. He was editor of the journal, No Place to Hide. Huge circulation on that. I was a regular subscriber. Since 1996, the task force has provided a global clearinghouse that makes the music a little bit lower. technologies, injurious effects, and a national support network for people disabled. They've been disabled by all this uh, cell phone RF technology. Oh. In 1997, the task force was the lead litigant in a challenge brought by over 50 citizen groups that get against the FCC's limits for human exposure to radio frequency radiation. How'd they get on with that? Anyone know? Post in the comments down below. Fristenberg is also president of the Santa Fe Alliance for Public Health and Safety, which he co-founded in 2005, which found a, a successful ooh, campaign to oppose citywide Wi-Fi in Santa Fe. Yeah, how's that working out now? <laughs> Wi-Fi is everywhere in Santa Fe. Let me see if I can find a map. Yeah, Santa Fe, here we go. Well, uh, something tells me <laughs> they weren't very successful. <laughs> downtown Santa Fe, I don't live in Santa Fe, but anyway, downtown Santa Fe. <laughs> Sorry, it's riddled with Wi-Fi, oops. Now, right back here in episode 55, wow, in January 2010, that's a blast from the past, back in the old garage, I did this video on uh, <laughs> the radiation levels of Wi-Fi because you could apparently harness energy from Wi-Fi and it showed you how little energy is available in Wi-Fi. And I go through uh, the numbers here on the whiteboard. Surprise, surprise, here's a little secret you might not know. RF energy drops off with a square distance. And when you've got an antenna that's with a 360 degree radiation pattern like Wi-Fi, you calculate one small area, one dis one small like square centimeter area, like one meter away from the antenna, and you can calculate how much uh, power is in that one 
<laughs> square centimetre or whatever, it's yeah, half a big deal. But, you know, eh, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. He is president of New Mexicans for Utility Safety, which he co-founded in 2015, which is which succeeded in stopping the deployment of smart meters in New Mexico cities. He co-founded the Global Union Against Radiation Deployment from Space in 2014 to oppose global wireless internet from thousands of satellites in space. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out too well. SpaceX are really pumping those satellites up there. Unbelievable. But he's a published author, look at this, in renowned journals. Articles by Fristenberger or about his work have appeared in Mother Jones, The Ecologist, Earth Island Journal, Vegetarian Times. <laughs> Vegetarian <laughs> Times. Yes, getting something published in Nature. It, no, Vegetarian Times. That is the that is the pinnacle of scientific research, Vegetarian Times. <laughs> Wow, it, it's got to be true. Village Voice, Newton Reader, Townsend Letter for Doctors and Patients, oh, New York Daily News, San Francisco Chronicle, and other newspapers and magazines. After graduating with a BA in mathematics, so yeah, not an engineer, uh, he attended the University of California Irvine School of Medicine from 1978 to 82. Injury by X-ray overdose. <laughs> Sorry to hear, Arthur, but um, yeah, X-rays are really powerful and they're really close to you. Danger, Will Robinson. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cut short his medical career. For the past 37 years he's been a researcher, consultant and lecturer on health and environmental effects of electromagnetic radiation. Yeah, so just because he got injured by an x-ray overdose, uh, Cut short his medical career since then, uh, yeah, RF's the problem. But back in 1967 it was the winner of the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. Wow. Hang on, you get a Bachelor of Arts in with major in mathematics? I thought, uh, yeah, Bachelor of Arts. Yeah, Bachelor of Arts in mathematics, so it's not, it's an arts degree with a major in mathematics? Okay. Anyway, highly, highly credentialed in the medical and engineering fields, obviously. And he's practically a superhero. Look at this. Injured by overdose of x-rays, he became hypersensitive to electromagnetic radiation. Oh, wow. Yeah, like, is it, does he have a cape? I mean, uh, seriously, you need a cape. Capes are cool. I'm just saying. You could have, like, an electromagnetic spectrum on the back of the cape or something like that. He became hypersensitive to electromagnetic radiation. Uh, can't be all up here. So yeah, pretty much, uh, I think for the last 40 years he's been uh, running this whole uh, shtick to do with, yeah, RF radiation and all sorts of other, <laughs> like hypersensitivity and cell phones cause cancer and whatnot. So yeah, that's who's uh, running this whole shebang. Great. You know, we've got other signatories here. Let's have a look. Uh, scientists, let's have a look at engineers, shall we? Because we do know engineers. I wonder if, uh, read PDF in engineers. Let's have a look. Uh, boop, oh, engineers, Australia. Okay, here we go. Ah, oh, Mohan, he's got a Bachelor of Technology. Uh, Peter, good on you. Wow, all these engineers in Australia have signed it. Must be legit. Wow, these keep going and going and going and going. <laughs> wow, I feel left out. Jeez. Is there some secret handshake I'm missing out on? Austria, not Australia. All right, let's have a look at these world-renowned scientists. Once again, Australia, look at them all. All these scientists, they're all signing up. They're all signing up for this woo-woo. Wow, they must have all uh, missed out on their basic science 101 class, I'm guessing, but uh, <laughs> no, 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 we're in Austria again. And all these other people who signed it. I mean, like these 227,000 chiropractors. Ah, <laughs> the woo-woo field of choice. Um, <laughs> building. What's a building biologist? Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> veterinarians, beekeepers, other professions, <laughs> sex workers. <laughs> signed it <laughs> stop 5G because it'll impact their business. Yeah. Oh boy, anyway, let's read the appeal. Ah, oh, this could go on for hours and hours. <laughs> Just kick back. To the UN, the WHO, EU, Council of Europe, Europe, and governments of all nations. We, the undersigned scientists, doctors, environmental organizations, and 
citizens from link link countries urgently call for a halt to the deployment of 5G, fifth generation wireless network, including 5G from space satellites. 5G will massively increase exposure to radio frequency RF radiation on top of the 2G, 3G and 4G networks for telecommunications. Actually, 2G is now defunct. Um, 3G is like going this, at least here in Australia, I think is going like ne this year or next year or something. They've already announced it's uh, retirement. So it's like, if you don't have 4G, you just, things will stop working. I mean, you can't use the 2G phone anymore. RF radiation has been proven harmful for humans and the environment. Yeah, it can be if you get close enough. But that's the trick, ain't it? The deployment of 5G constitutes an experiment on humanity and the environment that is defined as a crime under international law. No, it's basic engineering. Yes, there's been a ton of research um, on the effects of this, and most of the studies show, well, unless you're, like, got your phone. Damn, this is my phone. I don't carry my phone around here. Anyway, unless you keep it up like this, like, all day, like you're one of these business people who keep it here, like, 24-7, and you're continuously transmitting like this, I did, you know, yeah, you can get some localised heating effect and stuff like that, and it could actually cause a problem in extreme cases. But most people who use one for like uh, uh, 10 minutes a day or whatever, even like an hour a day perhaps, it's not really a problem. That's why it's so hard to actually find real research that actually proves it. I mean, I'm talking about like proper peer-reviewed research that comprehensively uh, proves that it's a problem. It's not. But it can be, and that's the thing. In all these woo-woo claims, there's always a kernel of truth in there. And that's how they uh, pull people in and suck you in. For those who actually don't, couldn't be bothered, which is 99.999% of people, more, that of practically 100% of people who will sign this, I guarantee, have not gone into the actual claims for this down the bottom and, and, and gone and looked at the references and actually tried to understand them. Guaranteed! I bet you there's not one person on that list, apart from the guy who's actually done it, has actually bothered to go in and read this stuff. Telecommunication companies worldwide with the support of governments are poised within the next two years to roll out the fifth generation wireless network. This is set to deliver what is acknowledged to be unprecedented unprecedented societal change on a global scale. We will have smart homes, smart businesses, smart highways, smart cities, yeah, and self-driving cars are uh, decades off. Look, I'm not a fan of smart home appliances either. In fact, I'm not even a fan of 5G because 5G is, if you listen to Shari on the signal path, it's very... Uh, it's designed for extremely high bandwidth, sort of like pretty much kind of, yeah, you can electronically steer it, but basically point to point kind of thing. It's just not a replacement for 4G. And it's just, like, it's not gonna, we're gonna have one day 4G vanish and 5G be the thing. It, it just can't happen. You need so many points of presence, I guess, or what's the correct term? So many like uh, transceivers scattered around the place it's next to impossible it's not a replacement for 4g technology so it's like it's just meh it has some niche use but <laughs> like people aren't going to be transitioning to 5g why on earth do you need like you know one gigabit per second on your phone it's just absolutely ridiculous what is not widely acknowledged is that this will also result in unprecedented environmental change on a global scale. The planned density of radio frequency transmitters is impossible to envisage. In addition to millions of new 5G base stations on Earth and 20,000 new satellites in space, 200 billion transmitting objects, according to estimates, will be part of the Internet of Things. Yeah, I hate the Internet of Things grown. And one trillion objects a few years later. Commercial 5G at lower frequencies and slower speeds was deployed in... Uh, uh, Qatar, Finland, Estonia, mid-2018, the rollout of 5G at extremely high millimeter wave frequencies is planned to begin at the 20 end of 2018. Looks like this has been going a while, this thing, <laughs> but it's just come to my attention recently. So yeah, the thing about this is that all these, you know, one trillion objects, the Internet of Things is like extremely low power. We're talking like Bluetooth and Ant and other uh, low power protocols. It's not like we're gonna all have little 5G internet of things, things pumping out like watts of power on a little node. It's, it's just ridiculous. We're down in like the micro watt region.
So even if there was a 5G transmitter 100 meters away on the building, I can see over there like that. Um, <laughs> By the time it gets here and gets through the window, because it's attenuated hugely through uh, objects, it's pretty much uh, you know a line of sight. You can't have anything in the way uh, for 5G. It's absorbed very easily. And by the time it hits my window here, we're down in the microwatt region. It's not a problem. It's about energy, heating. You don't get much heating from microwatts. You see, the thing is, well, 5G is higher frequency than... Uh, 4G, we're talking typically like 25 plus uh, gigahertz here, uh, as opposed to like like five odd gigs, whatever uh, the current 4G networks operate at or under that in various uh, places. Uh, really, we're not talking about any higher transmission or reception levels, but uh, for but we are talking about more transmitters per tower. Uh, for example, these are so-called uh, MIMO antenna arrays, like a 5G system, uh, because it will have more uh, slots available. It might have an array of you know, uh, 64 by 64 uh, transmitters and receivers, for example, whereas a 4G tower might only have like 4 by 4 at most, something like that. But in terms of the actual, if the tower is 100 meters away on that uh, roof uh, next door to me there, we're talking basically the same power level actually uh, hitting like per square centimeter per meter, however you want to measure it, um, of a person or the antenna of the reception of your mobile phone or whatever. So it's essentially no different to what we already have with the 4G system. There's nothing magical about 5G. Yeah, it's higher frequency, but that doesn't make it dangerous. In fact, it makes it less dangerous because it's less able to penetrate various objects. I'm behind glass here. It's not going to penetrate this glass very well, unlike the 4G signal that my mobile phone can pick up. You know, I get four bars here or whatever. Whereas 5G, I'll probably get zippity doodah because it's got to come through either like the glass and the wall and things like that. So in fact, it's really less of a problem than our current 3G and 4G systems in terms of like uh, electromagnetic power levels. 5G just uses a wider uh, frequency band, so it has hence why we can get higher bandwidth and things, and it has more slots available on each tower so that everyone can get their one gig or 10 gig bit connection or whatever like that, or more people can get it than you'd get on the uh, 4G network because it's using up a narrower uh, frequency range. So there for the data rate is effectively got to be lower than 5G but in terms of like power level there's nothing magic about 5G or magically dangerous about 5G in fact I think it's probably less dangerous than 4G or 3G it's just dumb and they love to use words like this. I'm, sure, I'm surprised it's not in bold. You know, the rollout of 5G at extremely high millimeter wave frequencies is planned to begin. I mean, <laughs> as if the frequency has some, it uh, just makes it more dangerous. In that case, oh, light. Oh, you better shut your eyes. You don't want to be, you know, bombarded with all that light radiation you're getting. <sighs> Despite widespread denial, the evidence that radio frequency RF radiation is harmful to life is already overwhelming. Is it? Really? Is it? <laughs> the accumulated really? clinical evidence of sick and injured human, <laughs> sick and injured human beings, like <laughs> scientifically proven uh, so radiation. For much. Because this guy got dosed with Let's some x-rays and got turned into a... <laughs> 40 years ago and got turned into a Love superhero. 5G Damaged to DNA cells and organ EG. systems in a wide variety of plants and animals and epidemiological evidence that a major diseases uh, that the major diseases of modern civilization, cancer, heart disease major and diabe diseases. diabetes in large part caused by electromagnetic pollution forms of literature based on well over 10,000 peer reviewed studies. <laughs> yeah, written on toilet paper. <laughs> the telecommunications industry plans 5G to fruition. People. No person, no nice. animal, no bird, no insect, no plant on Earth would be able to avoid exposure 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, to levels of RF radiation that are 10 to hundreds of times greater than what exists today. Really? Are they? <laughs> yeah, we might have more uh, towers around and things like that, but in terms of reception level, it's the same <sighs> thing. We're already completely surrounded by uh, RF radiation and it hasn't proved actually proven scientifically proven to be a problem and permanent damage to all of the earth's ecosystems i think the earth's like, 
quite capable of taking care of itself. Thank you very much. <laughs> Immediate measures must be taken to protect humanity and the environment in accordance with ethical imperatives and international agreements. <laughs> 5G rules out the massive increase in inescapable involuntary exposure to wireless radiation. Dude, just go live in the woods. You'll be fine. You'll be getting like nanowatts from the satellites. You'll be okay. <laughs> just build your house out of tin foil. You'll be fine. Ground-based 5G. In order to transmit the enormous amounts of data required for the Internet of Things, 5G technology when fully deployed. Internet of Things as little tiny power devices that mostly that need, you know, <laughs> like microwatts of uh, power consumption, they run off the smell of an oily rag. They're not going to be transmitted on 5G. They even admit poorly transmitted through solid material. This will require every carrier to install base stations every 100 meters in every urban area in the world. Yeah, because the difference is, is that, uh, let's say 4G, 3G, for example, can penetrate the walls and the glass that we've got here, and I get X amount of microwatts reception level it's going to be no different if we've got a little micro 5g transmitter like within like in the top of a warehouse or something like that you're still going to get the same reception levels it's not like they're going to install like a 10 kilowatt transmitter at the top of that warehouse it's just, it's just ridiculous they have these little different categories for micro transmitters and micro arrays just like this and I'm going to Wikipedia here, so please forgive me if I'm not a Wikipedia fanboy. But look, we have these different categories. Femto cells, pico cells, micro cells, metro cells, things like that. They have different power output ratings. If you're talking tens of meters, things like this, you're not going to install in, as I said, like a 10 kilowatt 5G tower um, in, in a little warehouse that, you know, is like a 10 meter high roof or something like that. You're going to install in like sub Wi-Fi levels. This is lower, lower levels than a typical Wi-Fi router. But I guess, yeah, you tried to stop Wi-Fi back in the like, 90s or whatever and that failed. But like, we're talking like serious, ridiculous. This is output power levels, not to mention actual reception levels. Do the calculations. Drops with a, a square of the distance. You can calculate, okay, you've got a 100 milliwatt transmitter up here. Calc assuming that it's like a, it's like shaped like this, for example, you've got X square, a radius on the ground. Calculate that radius. Calculate the amount of power per square centimeter or per square meter at that distance. You're fine. It's <laughs> that all. Oh, actually, <laughs> they do actually I'm fine for you. Wi-Fi here. Here we go. Twenty uh, uh, outdoors. Uh, I, 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 like yeah, uh, like yeah, you. Wi-Fi rowdy can actually. Oh no! Don't run away. They let you set the output power level. They might even tell you what it is in milliwatts. And that's the thing, with Shit. these output no, ones, yes. like, yeah, okay, you it might be away. transmitting at like 10 yeah. watts, 20 Play watts, something and like that. You know, treat. you put it in the middle of some huge park or something like that, and it's got to cover like hundreds of metres circle radius like this. So unless you climb the freaking tower and stick your head right up to the thing, it's not going to be a problem. But you better ban all those like five watt walkie talkies and stuff. Like you whack a walkie talkie up to your head like one of those UHF radios and they're pumping out, you know, five watts or whatever. That's like right next to your head. And, and people are complaining about, oh, this might be like maybe maybe five to ten watts output power for a micro cell for like hundreds of meters. Once again, it's the wording here. Unlike previous generations of wireless technology in which a single antenna broadcasts over a wide area, 5G base stations and 5G devices will have multiple antennas are raised in phase arrays that work together to emit focused, steerable, laser-like beams that just zap you like this. Unbelievable. In fact, it's more efficient. The thing is, doing this sort of beam forming actually leads to, uh, potentially leads to lower uh, reception and transmitter powers because you're utilizing uh, the transmit power and the bandwidth. Uh, in this particular case, so for a given, you know, data throughput or something like that, you could be talking about actually lower <laughs> power levels than what you're talking about with uh, 3G, 4G or other systems. 
and there's been much talk about this, the US FCC has adopted rules permitting effective power of those beams to be as much as 20 watts, 10 times more power. So if we actually go over and have a look at these uh, adopted rules here, um, yeah, you go into here, power limits, they're talking about um, an EIRP, which is the isotropic radiated, uh, effective isotropic radiated uh, power density of plus 75 dBm per megahertz uh, maximum. And that, yes, is uh, supposedly higher than 4G. But what you've got to take into account is that there's actually more uh, losses in uh, the transmission of this thing. So they have to up the power a little bit, but effective, but the uh, limits to the general public. We'll go into a presentation here. This is uh, from the FCC. And yeah, they say plus 75 dBm per 100 megahertz for fixed and base stations. And they've got other limits for mobile stations and transportable stations and, and stuff like that. Um, but yes, yeah, so it could be high, a bit higher than 4G, but the losses are greater. And if you have a look at this, uh, this is an Ericsson uh, thing, I think. And if you have a look at here, they've got like exclusion zones. Here's the antenna here, and they've got existing guidelines for the 10 watts per square meter, the exclusion zone for the general public, exclusion zones for workers, which can be up to 50 watts per square meter and things like this. So they still have to meet all of these requirements for exclusion zones. In fact, it's harder for 5G because of the potential to have a higher limit. Doesn't mean it's transmitting all the times and all the nodes. And you can have a look at actually one of these uh, MIMO small cell antennas here. You can see this one's got a 512 uh, well, that's not 512 um, antenna elements, but uh, oh yeah, no, there could be four per thing there. Anyway, um, yeah, like they're in an array like this, so they can do beam form and stuff like that. You're not going to always get the maximum, in fact, you hardly ever get the maximum power output out of these things. It's it's highly adaptive because the protocols and the communications is all like much more advanced than 3G and 4G, which just it can dynamically change the power, but this is far more advanced than 3G and 4G, which just spew it out. 5G is actually more advanced, so it could actually be potentially safer than 3G or 4G uh, or other types of uh, you know <laughs> transmission technology because it's so intelligent it can not only beamform but also uh, modulate uh, the output uh, power as well. So look, it's not a problem. Now if we have a look at who sets these guidelines, it's the ICNIRP. And if you go over to the ICNIRP, who are they? The International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. So they're the ones who protect us from this and set the standards about these, uh, you know, how far the transmitters have to be away and the reception power and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, let's go down here. Characteristics of the applications. There are a number of differences between 5G and previous wireless standards. One of these is that in addition to the EMF frequencies that are used for 3G and 4G, some 5G communications technologies utilize higher EMF frequencies, e.g. 28 gigahertz is currently used in the USA. EMFs at higher frequencies produce relatively superficial exposure. Relatively superficial exposure with less power penetrating deep into the body. As I said, like they have a hard time getting through objects like windows and walls like the 3G and your 4G do. The restrictions uh, in the guidelines account for this uh, to ensure that exposure does not ha ha cause any harm. Different EMF frequencies also behave differently in the environment. As a result, additional antenna are required to utilize these higher frequencies because everything you know, somebody farts uh, 10 metres away, <laughs> 5G, that's how low power these things are when they actually get to the receiver, it's ridiculous. These are to affect the exposure scenario appreciably and initial measurement studies suggest that exposure from 5G antennas will be approximately similar to that of 3G and 4G antennas. A key feature of the 5G wireless standard is that we we'll use beamforming technology which allows for the RF EMFs to be focused to the region where it is needed, e.g. E to a person using a mobile phone rather than being spread out over a large area. This will allow, for example, the same RF EMF frequencies to be sent to different users concurrently without interfering with one another, which increases communication rates, blah, blah, blah. This also, as I said, this also reduces exposure in regions where communication is not needed. 5G is actually better than 4G and 3G in this respect with no <laughs> appreciable difference in the uh, amount of uh, EMF, uh, RF energy that's actually you're exposed to. Come on. 
RF EMFs have the ability to penetrate the human body with the main effect being a rise in temperature in the exposed tissue. The human body can adjust to small temperature increases in the same way as it does when undertaking exercise and performing sporting activities. Jeez, I like still sweat for an hour after an intense class. Like, that's how hot my body's getting. This is because the body can regulate its internal temperature, however, above a certain level, referred to as the threshold RF exposure, and the accompanying temperature rise can provoke serious health effects such as heat stroke and tissue damage. Yes, if you're standing right next with your face like uh, pressed up against the transmitter. Another general characteristic is that the higher the frequency, the lower the depth of penetration of the EMFs into the body. As 5G technologies can utilize high EMFs in addition to those currently used, power from those higher frequencies will be primarily absorbed more superficially than from previous mobile communications technologies. Yet people are just going nuts over 5G because, oh, it's higher frequency, it must be bad. However, although the proportion of power that is absorbed superficially as opposed to deeper is larger than the high, is larger for the higher frequencies, the restrictions have been set to expose that a resultant speaks, yeah, peak spatial power will remain far lower than that required to adversely affect health. Accordingly, 5G exposures will not cause any harm, providing that they adhere to the guidelines. And as if cell towers and mobile phones aren't going to adhere to these guidelines. It's important to note that the uh, at the levels measured so far, the existing 1998 regulations before 5G was even a wet dream would also provide protection for 5DG technology. However, it is difficult to predict how new technologies will develop. Uh, they've made the new one, 2020, has made a number of changes to ensure that new technologies such as 5G will not be able to cause harm regardless of our current expectations. These changes include the addition of whole body average restrictions for frequencies greater than 6 gigahertz restrictions for brief six minute exposures and for frequencies greater than 6 gig and the reduction of the averaging area for frequencies above 6 gig so there you go that's from the actual body that is responsible for uh, setting the standards for like exposure limits and everything else so once again unless you climb the tower and stick your head up to the transmitter it's not going to be a problem <laughs> the actual uh, reception uh thing for the general public look this is 25 meters away and we're already outside the uh general public like uh exclusion zone and things like that so for this huge base uh, station it's pretty much just like a ballpark on par with 3g it's not like magically a thousand times worse it's, it's ridiculous all these fears are completely unfounded and once again, multiple laser-like beams simultaneously zapping people like, you know, a laser fly zapper. <laughs> cancer for you, cancer for you, cancer for you. At least five companies are proposing to provide 5G from space for a combined 20,000 satellites, low and medium Earth orbit that will blanket the Earth with powerful, focused, steerable beams. Each satellite will emit middle millimeter waves at an effective radiator power up to 5 million watts from thousands of antennas and the raised in the <laughs> Yeah, all of these uh, satellites have like five megawatt transmitters on them. They even admit it. Although the energy reaching the ground from satellites will be less than that from ground-paced antennas, it will irradiate areas of Earth not reached by other transmitters and will be additional to other ground-based uh, <laughs> objects. It's like, come on, it's not just pumping it out like this. It's more intelligent than that. That's the reason for 5G and beamforming. But even more importantly, the satellites will be located in the Earth's magnetosphere, which exerts sig a significant influence over the electrical properties of the atmosphere. The alteration of the Earth's electromagnetic environment may be an even greater threat to life and humanity than the radiation from ground-based antennas. See below. Oh, do we get into wacky thing? I've already... There's this thing about clouds. Let me show you this. Jesus. Our mental retardation PKE meter's gone off the scale for Dr. Naomi Wolf. If you enlarge, you see tiny waves throughout this giant anomalous cloud formation. Could 5G be having unintended consequences? EMF is a real thing that Europe more strictly regu regulates than the US. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sold. It's got to be the 5G woo-woo causing this cloud formation. Couldn't be any atmosphere, any other atmospheric phenomenon. No. 
Look at it, like, oh, there it is. There it is. I, that is clear evidence. I wish you could see these electrified looking clouds in the strange detail that my phone can't capture. Also, it correlates with people's ears. Heads hurting. <laughs> it's fine. There's reasons that your head's hurting, man. <laughs> but it ain't 5G. <laughs> it's 5G messing with delicate reactions of clouds and with fluids and tissues in human beings. <laughs> Would make sense? You think? X-rays are energy. <laughs> this is great stuff. Over New York City, a field of particulates shearing off to the right of man-made boundary line. <laughs> With these distinct fields of ripples. 5G, what is causing ripples like water in man-made cloud cover? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Cuomo isn't he the like the New York mayor or something? I don't know, something like that. Uh, I don't. Emissions visibility depends on atmospheric conditions among other things, but yeah, those ripples are damn weird. Microwave heaters in the atmosphere are confirmed now, confirmed along with chemtrails. Tomorrow, Congress votes on 5G. Wouldn't new? Uh, why wouldn't new energy ways create ripples in cloud cover? Other anomalies? I, it's clearly 5G. And look, look at those chemtrails. Yep, yep, yep. Confirmed. Confirmed. Ah, it's you know, the new world order. Illuminati. I, yep. <laughs> I would like to thank the sponsor of this video, the new world order and the Illuminati. Thank you. Harmful effects of radio frequency radiation are already proven because there's dozens of appeals from similar nutcase organizations. Yeah, that's proof. <laughs> sure. Oh, God. Look at all these. Look at all these. These are like miscarriage. Uh, yeah, cardiovascular disease. Cognitive impairment. Yeah, anyone who believes this is cognitively impaired, all right. DNA damage. Uh, oxidative stress. What on earth is that? But <laughs> clearly caused by 5G and RF. <laughs> increased, increased free radicals. I thought free radicals were a good thing, aren't they? Obviously behind the times. 5G causes autism, just like vaccines. <clears throat> and ADHD as well. I suspect it's not ADHD causing your kids to go hyper. It's because they're kids. Damage goes well beyond the human races. There is abundant evidence of harm to diverse plant and wildlife. Laboratory animals, ants, birds, honeybees, fruit flies. Oh, the trees, the trees just can't, they just quiver. 5G. <laughs> the WHO's International Agency for Research on Cancer concluded in 2011 that RF radiation of frequencies 30 kilohertz to 300 gig are possibly carcinogenic to humans. However, recent evidence includes the latest studies on cell phone use and brain cancer risks, indicative that RF radiation is is a proven carcinogenic to humans. Oh, like, let's just go check out these references, shall we? And this one here, International Agency for Research on Cancer, Non-Ionizing Radiation, World Health Organization. Let's, first of all, let's just look at, well, have we had an increased rate of brain cancer? Because people have their shoe phone, like, right up to their phone like this for hours a day. I don't know. I'm lucky if I get, like, one call a week from the wife, and then it's like, uh, I put it on the hands-free thing. But anyway, the people with their shoe phone up to their ear, you know, talk, people don't talk anymore, do they? They just socially chat now on their Facebooks. Jeez, when did I get my first phone? It was like the Nokia 5110, I think it was, and that's like just before 2000, something like that. If anything, we've seen, so that's kind of like widespread, like there was, like, you know, we've <laughs> got the brick phones before that and things like that, so, you know, but if anything, look, it's just like, the, the cancer rates of, if anything, they've dropped if you hold your at the angle, it's, they've gone down. So, like mortality, females, males, and uh, like, uh, like, come on, you don't even have to read the rest of the studies. The people are obsessed with these things. Oh, and before the new Facebooks and everything, everyone was like talking for like hours a day on their phones, and there's been no increased rate of brain cancer here in Australia. So, come on, like, <laughs> where's your data? So yeah, like you can just go and read all these uh, things until the cows come home, but really, where is the real data that the biggest transmitter that everyone has is that's right next to their brain causes, you know, it causes cancer and all sorts of, like where is it? Where is the increased rate of this? It's just not there. It's not in the data. So 
like, I, I don't know, you can go read this for yourself, like, but it says, like, this thing does not provide a quantitative assessment of any cancerous, nor does it discuss about any other potential health effects of RF radiation. This is a, this is a nothing burger. This is their <laughs> nothing burger. Not That's also nice. And monographs on the evaluation <laughs> of carcinogenic risks to humans. Nothing burger. For research on cancer for the World Health Organization. Okay. While the number of mobile phone subscriptions has been incre increasing rapidly around the world, changes in mobile phone technology have led to lower time averaged RF power emitted from mobile phones than that at present of those of previous generations. And 5G is doing a similar thing. I'm reading this thing and it's like, it's, it's a nothing burger. There's like nothing <laughs> Again. here that's going. Bingo! Nothing there. Like RF causes brain cancer and other stuff. It's just, it's just not here. So let's go to the evaluation at the end. Remember, this is the document that they cite as proof over here that RF radiation is possibly carcinogenic to humans. Blah blah blah. This is their actual, you know, this is their proof. Cancer in humans. There is limited evidence. It's, it's, it's highlighted, limited evidence in humans for the carcinogenicity of radiofrequency radiation. And they do mention positive associations have been observed, but there's limited evidence, basically. Like, with the billions of people using mobile phones, the countless studies over the years, there's limited evidence. It's a nothing burger. Cancer in animals, limited evidence in ex experimental animals. <laughs> like. Overall evaluation, radio frequency electromagnetic fields are possibly carcinogenic to humans. Possibly. Under what set? But is there data that actually shows that's happening in the real world? Of course. You stick your head up to your shoe phone for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you sleep with it right like this, and it's just continually transmitted, yeah, maybe you're going to heat up some of your brain tissue. And maybe if you do that for 20 years, yeah, maybe the odd person might get brain cancer. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Come on. And even here, they admit the human epidemiological evidence was mixed. <laughs> Several small early case studies were considered to be largely uninformative. A large cohort study shows no increase in risk of relevant tumours, but it lacked information on level of mobile phone use and where several potential sources uh, exposure. Things like that. Showed no increased risk of relevant revel It tells you! <laughs> no increased risk of relevant tumours. Of course, they have to say are possibly carcinogenic because under it, it, the most extreme circumstances, yes, of course, if you drink too much water, you're going to drown. The bulk of evidence came from reports of the Interphone study, a very large international model case study and a separate large case control study from Sweden. While affected by selection bias and information bias to varying degrees, even in their own evidence paper, it says that it was inflicted by selection bias and information bias. These studies showed an association between uh, glioma, I don't know what that is, and acoustic neuroma, I don't know what that is, and mobile phone use, specifically in people with highest cumulative use of mobile phones. Yes, on the same side as they had, which are the tumour development pieces, and yes, it looks like in some extreme cases, somebody had a tumour on the side of their head that they had their mobile <coughs> phone strapped to for bloody 20 hours a day. Unbelievable. The comparative weakness of the associations in the Interphone study and the inconsistencies between its results and those of the Swedish study lead to the evaluation of limited evidence. So multiple conflicting studies is what they're showing. I mean, come on. There was, however, a minority opinion that current evidence in humans was inadequate, therefore permitting no conclusion about a causal association. This minority saw inconsistency between the two case-controlled studies and a lack of exposure response relationship in the Interphone study. The minority also pointed out the fact that no increase in rates of uh, glioma or acoustic neuroma was seen in a nationwide Danish cohort study and that up until now, reported time trends in incidents related have not shown a parallel trend to time trends in mobile phone use. There's no association there. They just don't even correlate, let alone <laughs> have causation, really. This is like, it, it's, it's a nothing burger, really. I mean, sure, like, yeah, actually, uh, 
continue to study the effects of this sort of stuff on the human physiology but we've, had, we've been bombarded with this stuff for generations now and still the, like the studies are like eh, kind of not really but in the extreme cases yeah but like they're extreme cases yeah you'll just get the odd person strapping their mobile phone to their head for 24 or 7. The deployment of 5G satellites must be prohibited, blah blah, like bio, oh, biological rhythm, bio rhythms, they were all the rage in the 70s and 80s, weren't they? You could get bio rhythm calculators, you get it in your, uh, <laughs> you get it in your little uh, digital diary back in the day, you remember those like, sharp digital, you could get like bio rhythms, uh, <laughs> that was all the rage, whatever happened to bio rhythms? And the well-being of all organ organisms depends on the stability of this environment, <laughs> including the electrical properties of the atmosphere. Oh God! Explain the importance of Schumann resonances and why isotropic isoferic disturbances can alter blood pressure and melatonin and cause cancer, reproductive, cardiac, and neurological disease and death. Ah, oh, we we're just getting into whack whack job territory. These elements of an electromagnetic environment have already been altered by radiations and power lines. We had to get to power lines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I lived near power lines when I was a kid. <laughs> Nothing wrong with me. <laughs> the placement of <laughs> tens of thousands of satellites directly in both the ionosphere and magnetosphere emitting modulated signals at millions of what? Mill megawatts. Wow. Megawatt transmitters up there. Oh, I wonder where they get the power from. Geez, those, uh, those you know, nuclear thermoelectric generators must be pretty good tech these days. It's likely to alter our electromagnetic environment beyond our ability to adapt in formal monitoring. Anyway, this crap, it just keeps going on and on and <laughs> on and on and on and but it's on. funny crap both, uh, both acute and chronic effects and on and on and more references and more studies well governments are failing their duty of care to the populations they gather and it goes on and on and on um international agreements are being violated children think of the children the nuremberg code you can't experiment on humans you can't possibly put 5G transmission. That's experimentation on humans. It's inhumane. I like are we no, we're not even halfway. Look at the scroll bar. Oh, we call up on the oh they just this is like the classic sales technique of any like scam. Although these people though genuinely believe this stuff. They really the people behind this genuinely believe. They are that deluded that they will just find every little scrap of evidence, regardless of how re relevant it is, um, <coughs> to uh, to actually uh, prove their cause. Respond to appeal, and it just get it. Oh no, no, sorry. Here's the. It's just signatories. Okay, we're, we're at the end. Whew. Anyway, I there you go. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to call it quits. That is the international appeal to stop 5G on Earth and in space. So, yeah, let, let us know in the comments down below. Uh, my engineering audience, my 700 plus thousand uh, audience of engineers, are you going to go sign it? Are you embarrassed that you signed it five years ago or something and your name's in that list? <laughs> Anyway, that's absolutely hilarious. So yeah, 5G causes everything. It's it's the magic woo-woo that causes the coronavirus and causes cancer and it's going to kill our kids and the bees and the environment. Unbelievable. Yeah, that mental retardation PKE meter is just off the scale. <laughs> It's just ridiculous. Anyway, leave your thoughts down below. I like this is not a proper debunking. It's just it's just having a laugh. <laughs> These nut jobs. Anyway, yeah, don't just stop reading the news and about this sort of stuff and like you see these posts on Facebook or wherever and with all this woo-woo of all this crap in here and they just bamboozle you that scientists and engineers and also you know people are all signing this thing and it must be legit and it's like no look come on this is just blah 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 and all these references and you go in and read them and they're like nothing burgers <laughs> like they, they really are Seriously, and all that, but they've put serious studies behind this, and, and it's just very little.
to if anything has really come out about it. If anything, they all conflict each other and they even admit in here that it's just, you know, it's not, no, no, it's a nothing burger. Anyway, there you go. Hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. I, I can't handle this anymore. <laughs> Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. Links to other whack job articles and, and news reports and things like that. People ripping down soon. You know, <laughs> unbelievable. Catch you next time. That was a lot of fun, fun to listen. About the bullshit of, about the negative bullshit about the FG. Hi, it's repair time. I've got myself a classic HP, none of this Keysight rubbish, or let alone uh, Agilent rubbish. HP 54616B, 500 meg scope, 2 gig samples a second, 1 nanosecond uh, peak detect. This is still a very potent scope uh, these days. So if you can actually pick up one of these quite uh, cheaply, if you can, um, they still go for a reasonable uh, penny if it's a working and in good nick. Um, and this one's in um, a you know, reasonable nick. It does have, uh, you know, some chips on the corners and stuff like that. It's obviously been dropped. Uh, it's got some paint on the top. It says power on, power's on, no signal. So uh, at least it should power on in theory. Anyway, I do like the form factors. You've heard me rave on about the uh, 54600 uh, series before and how I absolutely love that scope. And they're still very nice if you can pick one up the mix. Uh, signal version option interface pro power uh, the calibrator output um, and that's about all she wrote so let's power it up see what's wrong with it all right fingers crossed you can go bang you can hear the fan whirl in oh, oh there we go yes HB yeah brilliant copyright 1996 we're in like Flynn hello hello yeah, the, the, the geometry of the screen looks really good. Sorry about the flicker, you will uh, get some of that, but that looks like it works. Well, it, um, th there we go, we can move channel one. Oh, there we go, channel one, they just decide to pop up. What's the, what's the time base? No, the time, oh, hello. Hello, the time base is there. 100 nanoseconds per division. It's not recognizing the time per division. Oh, okay. So time division doesn't work. Main delay doesn't work. Tri oh, trigger mode button doesn't work. Measure. Hey, measure works. Time, cursors. Okay, I forgot to show you the BNCs. They look a little bit uh, crusty, but they're physically um, intact. You could uh, clean those up. All right. so.
Oh. Oh shit.
Thanks. There's a better way. Better way. There's a better way. There's a better way. There's a better way. There's a better way. Thank you.